He uh, recently joined us and became a really great member of our SIP core team. And then uh, Jogan here, uh, based in Manila, is uh, our SIP expert. So we'll uh, try to do a, uh, a WebRTC demo built into this and uh, quickly uh, talk a bit about where we see WebRTC go and why we think this is uh, important and exciting. I'd like to uh, start out with this quote here from uh, Phil Edholm, which is uh, quite a profound quote, I think, where he says, WebRTC and HTML5 could enable the same transformation for real time that the original browser did for information. So that's quite a mouthful, I guess. And uh, if that indeed is true, it would be a colossal uh, transformation on how we communicate. Now, Phil has quite a history. Phil uh, was the uh, chief technology officer of Nortel, and uh, that's uh, where I met him. And he then uh, uh, you know, came out of there and uh, is working with the No Jitter folks now and uh, participates in creating a WebRTC-based conference. So that WebRTC is really being promoted now from sort of the media side as well. And uh, he has been uh, pretty involved in that. So what is WebRTC, really, to uh, quickly recap that for those who haven't followed this that closely. Uh, in a nutshell, you could say WebRTC is a soft phone in a browser. It's basically integrating all the hard technology that you need to build media, voice, video, screen sharing, whatever, into the browser that then makes it really, really simple for developers to uh, develop all kinds of exciting clients. And, uh, you know, I used to say that it really takes client development down to high school level, and uh, that's true. There are high school kids who now take this technology and uh, create video conferencing clients and uh, things like that. So in that sense, it could be the next generation phone network since WebRTC allows peer-to-peer -peer connections, but in most cases, and specifically in an enterprise context, you need a server backend. You need something that a WebRTC client would connect to. And, uh, you know, OpenUC SIPX is exactly such a standards-based open backend that first allows you to participate in this whole uh, WebRTC development. It allows you to now take uh, real-time everywhere into every web app and ultimately into every mobile app. And uh, we'll talk about this a little more as we go along. And some people have said that this is really reinventing a $2 trillion industry, which again uh, goes right back to uh, Phil's quote and uh, how he feels about uh, the importance and significance of WebRTC. Uh, you could also say that this is pretty much Skype. I think Skype had the same idea, right, to create a client on a laptop or on a mobile phone that just works. And uh, Skype then did this in a completely closed, proprietary, encrypted way that uh, you know, nobody else can use but Skype. And uh, WebRTC uh, aims at creating the exact same user experience, the same simplicity in a browser, but in a standards-based and open way. And if you think Skype was successful, then think again. And uh, with that, I'll hand it over to uh, George to uh, talk about what uh, the status is in standardization. Thanks, George. Hello. So uh, basically, there is a WebRTC effort, and uh, the main uh, players in uh, browsers, uh, uh, in browser industry, are uh, joining this effort. Actually, not all of them, as usually. Uh, Chrome, Firefox, and Opera is, uh, are uh, supporting the WebRTC uh, effort, while uh, Safari and uh, Internet Explorer are going their own way. But uh, I'm going to talk about this. Uh, later. So um, about Chrome, Chrome uh, for, uh, is uh, supporting WebRTC for uh, desktop browser, is a full support, I'm, uh, meaning that uh, there is an uh, API for uh, developing uh, applications on top of uh, it. There is the session and transport layer, uh, the um, RTP stack, the um, uh, voice and video engine, they are all uh, in place there. And uh, you could, uh, developers could use them to create applications. Um, there are also some things that are not implemented yet, like uh, recording, a recording API. DTMF is also supported in, uh, in Chrome. Now, on the mobile side, they are uh, trying to, um, they are trying to uh, put the WebRTC in place, but there are some problems. Uh, they had some problems uh, uh, t while testing on different uh, devices. And uh, that's uh, not supported yet. They are uh, <laughs> claiming that uh, uh, in a couple of months, uh, they are going to uh, they are going to uh, launch it, but uh, who knows? 
Uh, then uh, Firefox uh, is also uh, another big player in this uh, in this area, and uh, they are uh, uh, cooperating together, uh, Firefox with Chrome, in this um, in this effort. Uh, for the desktop, they also have a full uh, support, uh, but uh, with some uh, limitations, like no turn on, uh, um, support or uh, again no recording API support. And um, on um, on mobile, they uh, they announced uh, they announced a full uh, full support with uh, with their uh, uh, Firefox uh, browser on uh, on Android. Also, Opera is um, is a player in a mobile area, and um, they have uh, they have a browser available with uh, again with some limitations like uh, video conferencing not uh, not uh, supported yet. On the other side, we have uh, Safari and Internet Explorer. Uh, Safari uh, and uh, Apple. Apple is uh, focused on their own FaceTime that was launched uh, launched back in 2010, and the um, um, the World Garden and the um, H264 uh, codec. Um, they are not um, um, they are not um, uh, allowing other uh, other uh, parties to to uh, access their uh, underlying uh, implementation. So that's why uh, this triggered uh, Firefox to remove their. Uh, Browser from uh, from um, Apple Store, uh, meaning that uh, Safari is using Nitro Nitro engine uh, for their uh, for uh, their browser, but are not allowing uh, Firefox, for example, to uh, to use that uh, that functionality. And um, of course, uh, Internet Explorer, which is not uh, uh, part of this uh, of this um, effort. Now there is a, a Chrome uh, developed a plugin for the uh, Internet Explorer named uh, Chrome Frame that uh, allows you to uh, to create applications, uh, WebRTC applications on uh, uh, Internet Explorer uh, six to to eight without uh, having this uh, any support from uh, Microsoft. And um, uh, of course, Microsoft is uh, creating a proprietary uh, path and uh, uh, creating uh, another, let's say, another. Uh, Standard. Uh, they are trying to uh, kind of for this effort. Uh, there is also the WebRTC for um, uh, for all a third-party plugin that could be uh, that could be used in uh, Safari and Internet Explorer um, and other uh, browsers that uh, are not supporting uh, WebRTC yet uh, and old browsers, for example. Um, but uh, they are all, uh, this uh, plugin all only works for uh, for Microsoft uh, operating system and is not supported on uh, Linux or um, iOS. Um, okay, uh, there is of course an ongoing fight over uh, codecs and uh, and uh, patents and uh, WebRTC. Um, WebRTC requires uh, uh, requires uh, uh, for voice the, the Opus and the G711 uh, codecs to be to be implemented, <laughs> uh, but they are not uh, restricting to this. They are uh, uh, requiring this too, but uh, they are saying that other uh, parties could uh, come uh, with additional with additional codecs uh, uh, for uh, for uh, voice, and this uh, triggered the Microsoft uh, to. Uh, not to uh, go this uh, path, this WebRTC, because they uh, they think that uh, that the standard should be free and should allow uh, uh, should not enforce a specific uh, a specific uh, codec like uh, Opus and uh, uh, so um, uh, the the Opus uh, it's designed for internet. Opus uh, uh, codec is designed uh, for um, internet. Um, and it's primarily used in WebRTC, and the G711 is used as a fallback, uh, as a fallback uh, codec uh, in, uh, in uh, for this uh, technology. The video codecs, uh, Google and, Mozi uh, and Mozilla uh, favor VP8, uh, VP8 codec that uh, was uh, acquired from uh, uh, was get by um, by Google from uh, on to when they acquired on to in uh, 2012, I think. Um, and uh, the patents um, are free and uh, and open source, and uh, that's why uh, Google and Mozilla favor this. This uh, doesn't uh, match with uh, with Microsoft Cisco or Apple uh, Vision that uh, they already have um, H uh, H264 uh, that requires uh, uh, requires a license. Now, if you, we compare this to uh, Codex um, VP8. Uh, VP8 mm, is uh, considered to be a little bit, uh, oh, let's say, bad than uh, uh, H264. But uh, um, given the fact that it's license-free and uh, um, nothing like this, uh, it uh, compensates uh, from 
from this uh, this point of view. And uh, of course, Microsoft that uh, is going with uh, with their own um, RT audio and uh, RT video uh, codex. Okay, so um, how does it work? Uh, in, and in the demo that we are going to uh, going to show, uh, show you, now basically we have the the open you see we have an uh, application that uh, is connecting uh, uh, via web sockets to to our uh, to our uh, uh, open you see deployment, and uh, then. Uh, uh, it uh, establishes a session. Uh, the browser acts like uh, phones, and uh, you could easily uh, get out the, the browser part and put there a phone, and uh, you have a, a typical uh, SIP, uh, uh, SIP call. And uh, then the media flows between the caller and the callee, basically between uh, between these two these two browser. Now, uh, the, in the browser side, on the browser side, uh, there are some uh, layers implementing. Uh, it, it starts with an uh, uh, with a web uh, web API, a JavaScript API, uh, for uh, developing uh, this uh, uh, this application. Uh, there is also the the signaling and transport uh, layer that is uh, built uh, on top of libjingle, but uh, it does not uh, stick with the uh, XMPP or Jingle uh, session and transport. So uh, here is where SIP could be uh, SIP uh, comes into into play and uh, uh, and it's used in this. Uh, Transport uh, layer. It comes uh, with uh, the RTP stack, with the um, with the uh, component an IC and stun uh, uh, component. Um, that is also the the video engine, the video engine that uh, does uh, the the voice uh, engine uh, that came with the uh, with the codec and uh, also a net equalizer um, and uh, uh, preventing uh, data loss and um, and also the the video engine that. Uh, uh, that uh, allows uh, a flow, uh, video to flow from uh, camera to network and uh, to to, uh, to remote uh, party screen. Um, now I'm I'm going to to leave Jogan to present uh, the CPEX SBC and how we uh, how we integrated uh, this uh, uh, this in uh, Open UC. Okay, um, WebRTC is different from, um, um, it's not compatible with SIP directly. So um, we have a new draft. Uh, it's not an RFC yet. It's uh, still work in progress. And um, we came up with this uh, a draft that um, allows SIP over uh, WebSockets to, um, uh, I mean, allow uh, WebSockets as a, uh, as a transport uh, for SIP. Now, WebRTC, as we know, um, is not uh, directly compatible with uh, traditional um, SIP devices, uh, simply because, number one, um, not most codecs are, are currently available in uh, traditional uh, devices. And it's currently requiring um, DTLS, which is uh, uh, en encrypted, like TLS, but uh, this time it's using uh, Datagram. And it combined that uh, on top of um, SRTP. So basically, it's securing what is already uh, supposed to be secure uh, stream. So it's extremely uh, secure now. And it's not, it's, uh, it's, it, it actually complicates things to um, bridge um, WebRTC and um, traditional sub devices. So what we did is. Um, we are going to come up with a component that would bridge this um, WebRTC into uh, the traditional phone that we have um, registered to SIPX using uh, SIPX SBC. So basically, this is also going to be an announcement that we're coming up with a new application that would um, handle um, media. So we're, we're going to um, eventually get rid of uh, the current um, media relay and um, use the SBC instead to um, handle uh, remote workers. And this is also the place uh, where um, we are going to um, bridge um, WebRTC to uh, traditional SIP devices. So the architecture that you see right now is uh, pretty basic. Um, the SBC will basically just be in front of the SIP proxy. 
So it could either reside um, on the same box as uh, the SIP proxy with another IP address, or um, you could um, install it on a separate box uh, all by itself and facing SIPX proxy. Uh, there's also, um, it's also possible to install the SBC in the DMZ so that it is the only thing that is visible from the outside world and is communicating to, uh, through um, dual NICs um, uh, with, to the internal network. So that, that's also now possible uh, with the SBC. Is this the last one? Okay, so what we're going to attempt to do now, uh, attempt now is to um, demo um, a, um, basically complete implementation of SIPX SBC already. So this is a, It's only showing my. Uh, no. Okay, um, my laptop um, is not um, showing on the screen, so what I'm going to attempt um, to do is just show you what this uh, is all about. Can you, can, can, can you see it? <laughs> can you see it? Well, what? You say use the elbow. Here is um, try it that uh, sip it uh, no try it that jsip .net. that's a, that's a URL and basically uh, the guys who created a draft uh, for um, sip over web sockets also came up with a client uh, JavaScript client and they're trying to demo it using this um, um, this website try it that uh, jsip .net. so anybody could actually use it it's free so what I did here is um, I registered. Uh, as you can see, it's, it's already registered there. I'm currently 2017, uh, registered to openuz.ezu.com. That's our uh, corporate uh, PBX install for OpenUZ. And what you see here um, is, uh, no, you don't see it. <laughs> Basically, I'm, <laughs> I, I, I'm trying to show you uh, the registration page uh, in OpenUZ. Uh, 
uh, showing that um, I'm currently uh, registered as 2017 and it points to the IP address of DSPC. Okay, so right now I'm using web, uh, WebRTC SIP or over WebSockets to register to OpenUC. Daniel here uh, is also uh, registered. What, what's your number, Daniel? 2021. It's 2021. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to call him and see if uh, it works. Hopefully. Okay. 2021. Okay. Um, I just made a call. You just answer? Yeah. Okay. There's Daniel. Can you see Daniel now? <laughs> Basically now, uh, within a couple, probably next week or a couple of weeks after Colab, we're going to come up with an RPM for uh, uh, CIPEX SBC. It's going to be available for both open source CIPEX CCS and OpenUC. So you could uh, you know, now work with, uh, with uh, WebRTC. Thank you. Need to exit presentation mode. Just hit escape. Yeah. Then you move this out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here we go. Good. Hey. <laughs> it's all engineering. the same thing. I think the Google guys are on the XMPP side right now. If you look at you know Google Talk and Hangouts, they chose XMPP as the signaling layer. And that works great for very basic things, but as you well know, you know if you want to replace a voice switch with XMPP jingle signaling, that's a tough call. Uh, but uh, it should be interoperable in the sense that you can obviously interoperate, you know, interop between uh, you know, what, what they do on the jingle side with XMPP and what, what SIP does. And uh, it, it's at least open, right? And it's, it's understandable by anyone. And then the media stuff in the browser is interoperable with browsers. It's mainly peer-to-peer. -peer. Uh, but like with Skype, you, you still need a, a server somewhere uh, you know, to establish the call, right? And uh, if you do this in a in a in a you know uh, in a in a commercial way, then you want to tie that back into your your corporate environment. If this is just just a consumer thing, then you could absolutely build a Skype-like network with this by just providing a distributed infrastructure of contact information that you you know have a profile and a contact and you know what server to contact, uh, you know, based on a registration. Right. And I think that will emerge inevitably that people will use this to create a, you know, a network of uh, interconnected systems. So I think 
you know, where Google exactly will go with corporate communications, I think is still open. They haven't really done that. But this is phenomenal technology. I mean, everyone who wanted to build a, a soft phone in the past had to either you know, buy this technology from Global IP Sounds in Sweden, which is the company Google acquired and put in here, or you spent years of development to build it from scratch and maintain it. This is real heavy lifting that you know, Google integrated here. And then I think there's something else I'd like to mention real quick that I don't know uh, you guys are aware. But there is this debate going on on the mobile app side, you know, how a mobile application is supposed to be developed. And you can build this as a native app, right? You, you build it for a specific operating system as a native application, or you build it as a web application, which is something that runs in a browser, and therefore is cross-platform, or you create a hybrid where certain pieces are native and certain pieces are web. And the balance was sort of shifting back and forth. You know, initially people felt this would go web really fast because the development is a lot easier. It's cross-platform, it's easy to maintain, but it's not quite as fast. It's, it's not quite as, as responsive and easy to do. And therefore, some companies like Facebook and others went back to native and they can afford this, you know, to basically develop a client uh, from the ground up for each platform and then maintain it. But it's not just a little different, it's, it's totally different because even the programming language you use for different platforms is, is different. And therefore, you know, the effort you put into native apps is, is, is quite significant. And with WebRTC now, the, the test will be to see whether this real-time component can actually be done in, in web development. And if that works and is responsive and fast and you know, provides the right user experience, then I would think probably anything could be built as a web app. And given that Google is obviously behind this, Mozilla is behind this, and some other big companies, you know, my bet is they will get it right, okay? that they will be able to create an experience in a browser that works. But when you then build a web app that you know, basically runs in a browser on a mobile phone, you don't see the browser. You don't you know, launch a browser first and then go to a website. It's a so-called browser component that is linked into, into the app so that you launch it like you would launch any other app and you don't know the difference between native and web from a, from a usability or user experience perspective. But if this really works, then web app development will become a lot easier. And you can do it cross-platform, you can maintain it, uh, and you know, the skill set required to develop a, a mobile app in, in, in web technology is obviously very different from native, right? Because it's not hardcore programming. It's more HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and things like this. So therefore, you know, my best bet would be that WebRTC has a bigger impact on mobile devices than it actually has on browsers on laptops for, for that very reason. Did you want to go back to the demo real quick? Or? If you okay. bear with us, yeah. we, we figure out. Uh, a little question, Jogan. Yep. Is this um, client using your demo, your early version of CPEX SDC? Yes. Yes. Um, uh, the, 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 the library being used by CPEX SPC is OS score, it's open source. Um, I wrote it some time ago and I put it into open source. Okay, so what you see here now is uh, the user is registered to openuc.isus.com and what I was trying to, see you, uh, trying to show to you was uh, 2017 is, uh, is uh, currently registered and you can see that uh, the contact is uh, quite clear because uh, this is uh, the SBC contact, uh, CPEX SBC contact uh, that was sent out to uh, CPEX and as you can see it's, uh, it's not NAT at all and it points to the address of the SBC. Okay, uh, you can do chat as well, I think. You can do, uh, first you, can, you need to call of course before you can chat. Okay, um, you just need to allow this. If, uh, if, if the site is HTTPS, um, you could actually just trust it. And um, Chrome no, no longer um, ask for that or confirm, but ask for confirmation. 
Okay, there's Daniel. So you, you now got a uh, video call over um, WebRTC uh, passing through CFX using uh, CFX SPC. And I, I think, uh, you know, just one additional word on uh, CIPEX SBC. So it's, it's not our intent to really build a full-fledged SBC. What this does is, and, you know, Joe can, can explain this more, is basically an app traversal for remote workers and uh, WebSocket termination for uh, WebRTC. And, uh, you know, we've always had that in, uh, in the core code base, right? We do, you know, remote worker support today with, with NAT traversal. And this is a more scalable way of basically doing uh, the same thing, right? I don't know, Joe, whether you want to add anything to that, but, uh, you know, that, that's what this is. Are there any questions on this? It's not going to replace a uh, CIPEX bridge, but we do have an intention to um, have a replacement for CIPEX bridge. Soon. I think that the problem with CIPEX bridge is, if you will, problem in, in quotes, is that you know, if you really want to use this for security and for SIP trunking, then you need certification with all the ITSPs and all of that. And I think that's where our partnership with Ingate comes in, right? Where you can use a, an Ingate box or you know the Ingate software uh, in, in a virtual or something like this. But for us to basically do all that certification is is, is outside of our scope. Is the, is the big SPC based on um, they have a common um, library, but it, they're totally different beasts. Any other questions on either Zipex SBC, WebRTC, anything else for the team here? Yeah. Did you just say you have to call before you can chat? Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> so they want to see chat. Um, oh, wait. Oh, you're disconnected already? Yes, disconnected. Uh, Um, it's, it's actually using um, message SIP, and uh, it's not using XMPP at all or any proprietary protocol or, or HTTP. It's using uh, SIP signaling for, for uh, the stack message. So I think like with all these things, you know, it's, it's literally exploding right now, I think, with lots of these clients, you know, jumping out of the woodworks, uh, open source, commercial, uh, you know, hosted clouds, this and that. What I think this shows is that it's pretty darn simple to build a WebRTC-based client, right? And you can make it look nice really easily. I think that's the beauty. Uh, the complicated part is the back end. And again, you know, we think that the OpenUC SIPEX infrastructure will be a, a phenomenal back end to terminate WebRTC-based calls. And you can use this for a lot of things. I mean, we want to integrate this into our Salesforce plugin. We want to integrate it into OpenACD. We want to integrate it into Zimbra, into Liferay, and you know everywhere where we communications enable a web app, this will go with it. And uh, therefore, you know, there's no limit to what you can really do. And I also think that this whole area of web conferencing is going to switch from Flash to WebRTC. And you know, as I'm sure you know, Apple uh, declared war on Flash a number of years ago, and uh, they basically won. Uh, Flash, uh, you know, is disappearing from anywhere. It hasn't even made to certain mobile devices like Apple's. And all the web conferencing applications, from WebEx to GoToMeeting to you know, all these different web conferencing solutions out there, all Flash-based. And this will provide 
a new way of creating web conferencing solutions where you can leverage the signaling backend. So you have you know, a SIP-based infrastructure or an XMPP-based infrastructure that you now can use to set up web conferencing sessions where the media then is originated in a browser with WebRTC and is received again in a browser. Okay? And I think that will you know, be another important point of integration of yet another solution that is important to unified communications uh, into the same realm, into the same you know, back end that then uh, you know, can, can integrate that together. Okay, uh, I think we're probably close to out of time. Do you have another question, Jerry? Yeah, just quick on the, on the codex. I mean, is that getting transcoded and set to the Yeah, um, sorry, sorry. Uh, I should have to explain it. Um, right now, uh, what we're doing here is uh, we're not transcoding anything. So basically what is currently working, what we could make work is our calls between um, two web RTC uh, browsers. So it's still, we still need to do something about you know, transcoding so that um, phones, uh, traditional phones would be um, part of uh, what could be called here. Okay. I think we should put a, a challenge grant out there for the first phone manufacturer who terminates a WebRTC call. And it's not rocket science because you know, all the stuff, the codecs you need, are literally open source. And uh, you know, I'm convinced that uh, that will happen. Uh -huh. All right, so I think we're going to go uh, basically without a break into the IM session, which is the last one of that segment. And then we have a break and uh, you know, come together as a team for some case studies. Uh, I know it's a bit of a tough day, but I hope you uh, can bear with us. Uh, and uh, Jerry will moderate the uh, IM session where we talk about the uh, XMPP instant messaging backend. And uh, I think, uh, is, is Alex participating in this second? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You got it, is that it? No, I think I if, you, it. if you go back, there is a, a directory that's open. Close yeah. that window. Yeah. Close it. No, no, no. Just don't close it for real. Let's go here. Uh, it's this one. Can't see whether it's there. Uh, apps. It should be Mike Dave. See, it's not, right? Report. attention. Um, this is probably going to be the best presentation you'll see, if not this week, this year, probably for the next decade, maybe the next century. Anyway, uh, I know it's getting late, but we're going to go through um, 
and talk a little bit more about it, uh, enterprise instant messaging. And we're going to go down deep a little bit. And uh, you're going to have to forgive me. Um, Mike is not going to join us for this. Um, however, Martin will uh, to talk about federation. Um, Okay, just want to make sure I pronounce Alex's last name correctly. We misspelled it, I think, in some of the literature. Matesco. Alex Matesco is working with us on our XMPP implementation, it has been for a little while now, with the team in Romania. And uh, Alex is going to take us through a little bit of a, a deep dive on what we're doing um, in the XMPP space and how that uh, is, is coming along and some of the things that we're, we're um, building into 4.6 and, and subsequent releases. So, the funny thing is, is that uh, enterprise instant messaging has been around for a long time, if you think about it. Um, things like IRC, uh, at the same time, uh, have been in use for quite some time. Uh, I think with the use of IEM through public services uh, like Yahoo and Google and others, um, it's becoming much more prevalent. And uh, I think that, that uh, users are expecting that type of experience within their, within, within their work environment. And um, you know, I think, and, and we use instant messaging before we use other forms of communications. I don't pick up a phone and just bang in an extension anymore. I look for someone's presence, and then I'll typically start a text uh, dialogue with them before I communicate. And I find that, that that's more and more the case in, in the enterprise as well. Uh, one of the things, though, is when you start looking at what people are implementing within their uh, IT environments, is that uh, it's a little mix of everything. Uh, I go into some organizations, and they're allowing public services to be used. I go into other organizations, they're not allowing anything to be used. And then I go into some organizations more and more now that have tried to take this back and control it and have a, a corporate standard, whether um, it was OCS to begin with or whether in engineering organizations, IRC, whatever that might happen to be. But I think they're still looking for, there we go. <laughs> all right, here we go. I was hoping to get these sprinkled all over the place by the evening. But uh, uh, I told you this would be the best presentation you had today, <laughs> as long as that doesn't hit you in the head. Uh, and if it does, the audio codes will be responsible for the insurance. But, um, anyway, so, um, so, you know, regulation and, and corporate governance are becoming more and more an issue. Uh, security, HR issues, et cetera, et cetera, playing into that. So we're seeing more, more and more dialogue from our prospects and customers around what we can do to help them with that. And you've seen a little bit of that sprinkled throughout the day. Um, I think the other thing is with, with people moving around a lot, uh, text-based communication is becoming more and more um, effective and, and allowing accessibility and mobility to, to be pervasive. And then finally, there's people like myself who have, um, have uh, 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 daughters or sons that are, are in this new work, you know, this new millennium generation, this new group of workers that is moving up very quickly. Um, and I'm not looking at you for any particular reason. <laughs> but, um, that this is how they do it. I mean, how many of you have sat around, if you have kids, on a Friday night to call them up and see what they're doing, and they don't return your call? Text them, right? Text them, and I'm talking about on a cell phone now. But text them, and you get that instant response. So that's what we're looking at as managers and, and as future, future managers. The, you know, the, the, the trend, the culture uh, is changing, and this type of communication is going to become um, uh, ubiquitous and, and, and extremely um, pervasive. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to turn this over uh, to Alex, and Alex is going to talk a little bit about what you need to to actually have an enterprise scale and resilient um, IM uh, application, and then talk a little bit about what we're doing in 4.6 to enable that, and uh, some of the things that you'll see as we move forward with the development of our, our technology. So Alex. Okay, so um, f f first thing you do when you think about uh, an enterprise uh, uh, class M, you, th you think about uh, a, a standard solution. Okay. 
you think a standard solution. So you, you may argue that uh, XMPP may not be de facto standard because, like Martin said, uh, Microsoft is entrenched in certain markets, and I don't know, maybe Skype has a great share of, uh, of this market. But you, when, you, when you say uh, open uh, IAM protocol, you usually say XMPP, and in this regard, the, this, this is the standard. So uh, in our case, um, we, uh, we also require uh, integration with, uh, with SIP because we, we, we deliver that in, uh, in our solution and you, you, you want them to work uh, as, as one solution. Um, there, there's, the, there's this requirement of uh, high availability because uh, up until 4.4 uh, uh, and uh, even in 4.6 uh, initial release, uh, the XMPP is, uh, is just a standalone server. And uh, for a, for a, for an enterprise, th this doesn't fly. I mean, they they, they need their service uh, to be up 100% uh, if possible. Um, we have also listed here um, the resilience requirement. Uh, we usually, when you say high available, it, it means that that's a resilient solution. But um, uh, what what we mean by this is. Um, uh, each node must be resilient because uh, one, one, one of the dangers of uh, uh, cluster solution is that uh, if, if it doesn't uh, um, work well under, lo under load, uh, one node will fail and will uh, add additional load on the other nodes and that, that will trigger a domino effect. So uh, we're, we're running a, a whole bunch of, bunch of tests, load tests. Uh, to make sure that um, the, the servers st uh, stay up and can handle uh, uh, what I think are uh, unrealistic uh, load, uh, loads. Um, we, yeah, we, have, um, we have set this uh, requirement to, to support, uh, to support uh, up to one million users. Uh, this is basically uh, Based on the preliminary testing that we did before, we moved the, um, uh, the, the server to a, high, a highly available solution. Um, and um, that, uh, the testing uh, revealed that we, we could uh, uh, support up to 240,000 users uh, back then. So uh, right now when we, we are moving to MongoDB, which is designed for tens of millions of more, Users, uh, we think uh, one million is a, is a realistic expectation. We will have to to follow up with the, with testing to confirm this. Um, of course, you need the you, you need the you need the solution to be configurable and manageable, and uh, to do it uh, as as, um, as easy as possible. Um, and uh, with this regard, uh, it's. Uh, this is almost a turnkey solution, so it's uh, it, it's actually very very easy to to configure through uh, the uh, OpenUC console that uh, everybody knows. So it's just a matter of uh, enabling and disabling uh, XMPP nodes, um, and also you can uh, independently configure um, MongoDB nodes for the for the database, so it's not necessarily for each uh, XMPP instance to have uh, one MongoDB node, or you can have more than uh, one DB node uh, uh, for uh, for one uh, uh, XMPP server, or whichever is the case. Um, uh, yes, we uh, we will uh, we were considering uh, multiple deployment modes because uh, yes. Um, um, I don't know. So different uh, different enterprises have different requirements. So you can, if you're not uh, not very la a large a company, you can uh, you can use a, a, a simple installation, a simple cluster. Uh, but if you are uh, geographically distributed, uh, MongoDB can do that too. So that whatever users have in in Boston area, they will stay in on Boston servers and. Uh, and so on. Uh, that, that's, uh, of course, uh, desirable because otherwise you'd be spreading uh, the information to um, to extra servers that may may not uh, bring additional solution. I mean, if you have like five or ten servers in Boston, that that would be enough. 
Um, another, mo another thing that you can uh, do with Mongo is um, uh, set up a, a read-only server that will act as a, as a backup. So uh, the, you, you get a, a very easy uh, way to, to secure your, your data if, if, uh, if needed. Uh, yes, you, you will also want to, to monitor your, uh, your solution. We, we have added uh, uh, a, a page in, uh, in the administration console um, that's uh, displaying the, the status of each Mongo uh, DB node, uh, and you can uh, add them and uh, del del add and delete nodes from there. It's uh, probably as, as easy as you as it gets. Um, what else we have here? Um, f uh, federation. So uh, while we are pro providing uh, XMPP, uh, enterprises may need to connect to additional uh, systems, and we we do this through federation. And uh, the flexible part uh, refers to the. To the fact that you, you can add uh, uh, plugins to um, connect to ad additional systems. So like uh, Chris from Red Hat uh, earlier said, they, they need the uh, IRC. So at some point, we'll need to add that. Um, yeah, and uh, I think this also covers the integration with other services. Um, okay. So uh, what, what we have today is um, uh, high availability, we, like I said, uh, using uh, Mongo. And um, uh, yes, uh, um, we have this uh, OpenUC management console that uh, helps you uh, manage your solution. And we, uh, we added um, uh, presence enhancements uh, in, into this that um, uh, you, w w when, a, when a user initiates a phone call, you will see this. You will see this in um, uh, not necessarily in Unite because th this is a server-side feature. So, whatever XMPP client you choose, you you will see this. Um, you will see this presence uh, for the user. So, it, it will be shown as uh, on the phone or something like that because the, the message is customizable. Um, performance. Um, we uh, we have, we began testing the, um, the 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 new solution, but uh, the, while we were testing uh, an, a new uh, version of the XMPP server was released, so we'll have to integrate this and uh, uh, re restart testing. Um, from what I, uh, I have seen, um, p performance uh, stays uh, w within the same ballpark as it uh, as it was, um, bec uh, because uh, yes, r right now uh, the, there's this uh, data replication that's taking place. So um, if 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 you take out the um, the clustering uh, plugin. Uh, um, op uh, OpenFire and uh, MongoDB are performing m much better than before, but w once clustering comes into, solu uh, into play and uh, has to distribute data around the nodes, it takes its uh, toll on performance. But we, we, get, we get back to about where we started, and uh, I think that's, uh, that's, that's encouraging. Um, uh, on top of that, the, the, the clustering plugin is rather young and could see some improvements. Um, and also the, the the new server that was released uh, also is supposed to to bring some improvements to the table. So uh, in that regard, I, I think uh, performance will be will be more than acceptable. So uh, what we're talking here is like um, uh, sustained uh, 200 uh, logins per second. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, uh, and. Um, a login transaction is about uh, uh, two seconds uh, w when a user has a roster up to 250 entries uh, large, 
uh, when you go ov over 250 lar uh, entries in the in the users rosters the performance begins to to degrade uh, from 2 to like 19 seconds so the, the that was a limit before we'll have to to retest this but um, for uh, for um, small rosters it stays about uh, the same um, what we are working on uh, right now is um, uh, a feature similar to this uh, on the phone uh, 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 presence enhancement that will um, will add um, um, presence enhancements based on um, um, on users calendar so you, you may have seen that unite has uh, has an outlook plugin but uh, this this also this only works when when you have uh, the Outlook plugin uh, started and can uh, relay uh, presence information. We are uh, we are going to use uh, CalDAV and uh, pull uh, pull data from uh, from a calendar server and uh, distribute it to um, uh, not only OpenFire. We'll we'll get there in a in a moment. Um, and we will. We are also planning on uh, working on this uh, geographical partitioning, which I uh, I mentioned uh, a bit earlier. Because yeah, this uh, this will be useful to to larger clients. Um, okay, so th this is what uh, what I have in mind. So uh, you you'll have. Um, you will have uh, partitioning between uh, uh, Americas, Europe, and uh, Asia. But uh, uh, keep in mind, th this is all, uh, this is still one cluster. It's just that uh, uh, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. So the data is uh, geographically located. Our clients will be able to to work uh, seamlessly so I mean if, if you are a client in North America you will be able to contact uh, someone in Europe or in Asia no, no problem and uh, here here is uh, a description of the um, um, of the feature I was I was uh, telling you about the free busy integration so basically, we'll have a, a new component, CPIX calendar, in this uh, diagram that will uh, pull uh, through out of uh, calendar inf free busy information from uh, various providers. We'll persist them, and uh, uh, components like uh, OpenFire or CPIX, re CPIX registrar will be able to subscribe to this presence. And uh, also uh, through CPEX config, you will have some, um, uh, I don't know if management, but you will at least be able to, to see what's going on. Um, what, uh, what, what you don't see here is um, we will Probably, if you if you want to obtain uh, the calendar information from uh, from from one user, you will need you will need uh, the user's credential. So we will need to figure out a way to, to provision that um, into into OpenUC. Um, um, one one of the main concerns here is um, is performance, because um, uh, CalDAV is uh, is not a push protocol. So we will have to to be very, very careful uh, with, the, with regard to the, to the traffic generated because uh, um, for, for a, a single user may have uh, several calendars and you you will want to to query all of them and you you can't uh, keep polling uh, each minute for like uh, I don't know five thousand users or some, something like that. That, that that's not sustainable. So um, the, this, this is uh, this is something that uh, we we haven't uh, figured out yet because we we need to get to a, to a working solution first and then then optimize it see see how we can uh, how we can improve things. 
if needed, may, maybe it will be the performance will be okay from from the start. Doesn't usually happen, but we can only hope. So um, um, I don't know. Um, Federation. Uh, I think I'll uh, turn it over to to Martin here. <laughs> Thanks, Alex. Okay. Well, terrific. I think uh, Jerry asked me to uh, talk to this slide real quick. Uh, you know, I think what uh, Alex was working on really is to take the XMPP server we've had all along and make it clustered. And we didn't make it clustered primarily because we needed scale, uh, because it actually scales phenomenally well on a single system. What we wanted is redundancy so that, so that we have you know, load sharing capability. And we ported the database backend to the same MongoDB that we use for everything else now, which allows us geographic distribution, so that now you can build a geographic cluster, as you had on the previous slide, where we can pair a SIP server and an XMPP server and a database, and then cluster that out. And you have geographically distributed load sharing for the combined system. And, uh, you know, the, the performance numbers that Alex is still working on, we think there is a, a good chance we can get to about a million users on, on four or five distributed nodes. Uh, I think that's way beyond of what we you know, are going to deploy in the near term. Uh, so that you know, scale of the system is, is really good. What is required is the, the resiliency that we need in, in the enterprise context. Now on the federation side, because this is XMPP, it naturally federates into everything else XMPP, and I think we talked about this earlier. There's a lot of that out there. Uh, Oracle has an XMPP server that they uh, inherited from Sun. Uh, you know, Google Talk, uh, Blackboard, which is used on the uh, EDU side a lot, has a built-in chat capability that is XMPP-based. Uh, Cisco Jabber is uh, obviously XMPP-based. Uh, eJabberD is another open source solution that is used uh, fairly broadly, uh, very powerful. Uh, Facebook Chat is uh, XMPP-based. Uh, OpenFire is XMPP-based. There are a number of other open source-based XMPP servers. Uh, I think Avaya has somewhere uh, hidden away an XMPP-based chat server. And then uh, for federation into all these other things, either legacy things or Microsoft things, we have teamed up with uh, Nextplane. And Nextplane provides a cloud-based federation service that is actually very powerful, easy to use, has a very powerful management backend that allows you to manage permissions and security so that you can federate between you know, your corporate system and a Microsoft system. And you can do this between companies, obviously, but you can also do this inside the company, uh, you know, federate through the next plane cloud for interoperability. And that not only works for just chat and presence, this also works for audio and video and other things that you can transport over Jingle. So that, uh, you know, this is a pretty powerful solution uh, for federation. We have another open source related effort to uh, federate into you know, some more legacy protocols like uh, IRC uh, in particular, as you heard from Red Hat early this morning, and other things. And uh, you know, that is a, an open source effort that is, is going on right now that I expect will be folded in at some point. Okay, are there any questions on federation? Yeah. Do what? Well, as long as it's XMPP, this works out of the box. So a, a good example is that uh, with our system today, you can use your Google Talk client on your smartphone and uh, federate the contacts between Google Talk and our system, and that works perfectly. You, you get presence, you chat, uh, so there's no there's no gateway required or anything. Uh, what we do on our side is we can allow or disallow certain domains so that you can put some, some security policy in place, uh, but there's no gateway required. I mean, I, I use my soft XMPP client to log into both systems, but you're saying that my identity, it's not that I'm using two identities that both represent me, it would be the same identity? 
Now, if you use Google Talk, then you federate out to your Google Talk identity, but you can federate in all kinds of contacts that you have. So if you have a Google Talk account, which you need to connect to the Google Talk system, then you can pull in you know, all the contacts you, you like that you, you, know, you would like to see on your cell phone. And once you've pulled them in, uh, then you can you know, chat back and forth. But it, it obviously it's a federated system, so it uses a, a, a Google Talk identity. If you don't want to do that, then you, you, know, you, you load an XMPP client onto your smartphone and uh, register it directly with whatever the XMPP domain is you use. In terms of performance, you mean? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. no, I, I don't think so. This is a so-called server-to-server -server connection, and uh, that scales the same way client-server would scale. So I, I don't think that this is a, a performance limit. It, it's more an issue, I think, as, as he mentioned, of you know what identity do you use? And obviously, you know, if you're on your federated system, it's a different identity. Uh, but you can federate with another company that uses an XMPP server uh, by just you know, adding someone with sort of a you know an XMPP handle and a domain to your roster, and the other end will then get an invite. And if you accept that invite, then you add that person to your roster as if that person was on your own system. So this is totally transparent, <laughs> seamless, you know, without gateways. And the federation into the Microsoft cloud is more complex due to the, the protocol mismatch. But Microsoft will sell you an XMPP gateway. So they realize that they you know, probably need one of those uh, so that you know, they have one that you can buy and pay for. And then you can federate into the XMPP world. Are there any other questions on IM? I think we, we would really be looking forward to you know, work with you more on deploying IM. I think we have been you know, working on this capability for some time. It uh, came out in the 4.4 release. Uh, Unite is out now that I think is a very powerful client, but you can use other clients. You know, there are people even on our team who use Pigeon, uh, an open source client, Adium on Mac, uh, you know, whatever client on your mobile. And I think the, the IM capability that OpenUC comes with free of charge built into the license is an IM system that you know absolutely measures up to what Cisco has in the market or what Microsoft has in the market. This is a very you know powerful IM uh, capability, uh, including group chat, uh, you know presence obviously in all these different features, and uh, you know we would be very excited to uh, work with you some more on uh, getting some pilots going and uh, get, get that deployed. I think it's a terrific add-on to a phone system. You really you know, start having presence-based communications. And for most people who do this, it, it's a game changer. You know, it becomes rude to just call someone. Uh, it literally does. You, you, you stop doing that. You, you look at someone's presence. You, you ping them on chat and you know, politely ask whether a call would be good. Uh, it, it changes your behavior. And I think, as Mike said earlier, for remote workers, if that thing is down and you, you, you don't have that client up, then you feel isolated. Right? So it's not geographic distances. If you don't have that thing, then suddenly you feel disconnected from the rest of your team and what you do. And as soon as it comes back up, uh, you, know, you collaborate almost seamlessly across huge distances. And we do this in our team all day long. I mean, without chat and presence, we couldn't function. Right, with a team that literally is you know, spun around the world, that there's no way we could collaborate and communicate without uh, you know, IM and presence. It would just not work. OK, I think unless there are any other questions, we're out of time and have a, a break scheduled yeah. now.